Hello, I've been asked to talk to you about the uniqueness of Christ in an age of pluralism. That's a big subject. In fact, it's two subjects. So I'm going to give you two talks, and the first one about an age of pluralism. Seventy years ago, I was a boy of 12 living in the northeast of England, and the only religion I knew was Christianity. Every village in Northumberland had two places of worship, an Anglican parish church and a Methodist chapel, and I was brought up on the Methodist side. In the towns, there was a sprinkling of others, Pentecostal, Baptist, Presbyterian, because we were not far from the Scottish border, but all Christian. And so I was brought up in a Christian country, and Christianity was what shaped our culture and what shaped our national character. But it wasn't to last. Other religions I became slowly aware of, but they were all foreign. They belonged to another country. And uh, I used to collect money to send missionaries to those countries to persuade them to change their faith to what we all thought was much superior to their own religion. What has really happened and transformed our awareness is the fact that now we know so much about other religions. We found out that one other religion is growing faster than Christianity, though it hasn't caught up yet. If you had told me 70 years ago that one day I would write a book predicting that another faith would become the dominant religion in Britain, I wouldn't have believed you, but there's the book the challenge of Islam to Christians. When I was a boy of 10, there was only one mosque in the whole country. It's just outside Woking. You can see it if you go by train from Woking to London. Now there are hundreds. There are 120 Muslim schools. There are 85 courts in this country applying Sharia law to people living here. It's just transformed the whole situation. Here are some of the factors that have changed our awareness of other religions. First factor is immigration. After World War II, Britain threw open the doors to anybody from the Commonwealth who wanted to come and live here. And so they poured in from the West Indies, which were largely Christian, from Pakistan, which is Muslim, and from India, which is Hindu. And now suddenly the religions are on our doorstep. So immigration was the first thing. If you go to Bradford, Birmingham, you'll wonder which country you're in. Even walking up Oxford Street, you wonder where you are. Immigration then was the first factor that helped us to become aware of other religions. The second factor was cheap travel. When air travel became cheaper and we stopped going to Blackpool for our holidays and went to Benidorm and then further afield to Bangkok, now people take their holidays all over the world and therefore we become very much aware that other countries have a very different culture and faith to ours. The third factor is media. Radio, television particularly, are now producing so many programs about other faiths that we are all becoming quite knowledgeable about other religions. And the fourth factor is education. Almost every school in Britain now is teaching what's called comparative religion. When I was a boy, they taught religious knowledge, and it was almost entirely confined to Bible knowledge. Mind you, I have to admit it was one of my worst subjects, and here I am a Bible teacher years later. But we were taught by a vicar who was more interested in cricket than anything else, so I never really got going in that field. But religious knowledge was Bible knowledge. And so we are now all very much more aware of other religions. And the big question is, now that these religions are living in the same towns, in the same villages, even in the same streets, how are they going to get on with each other? It's a big question. Are we going to have 
great hostility, even hatred between them? Or will we manage to keep the community peace? Will they live together? There are four possibilities of relationships between the different religions. The first I would call antagonism. And I'm afraid we have a sad history over centuries of religions that have been so convinced of their convictions that they are willing to die for them and even willing to kill for them. And when you study the history of religion, you find that there have been awful, bloody conflicts between them which have cost lives. There have been conflicts between religions, between, for example, Islam and Christianity, the Crusades, the Inquisition, although it was the Muslims who first of all conquered by force and came right into Europe, right up to the gates of Vienna and right up to Poitiers in France before they were pushed back. So there has been antagonism on both sides. But the antagonism isn't only between religions, it's actually within them. And within Islam, for example, we've had the dreadful conflict between Iran and Iraq, between two denominations of Islam, between the Sunnis and the Shias. And that was a terrible war. Even within Christianity it has happened. Anybody who knows anything about Northern Ireland knows that Catholics and Protestants have both attacked each other. I've noticed that this only happens, this real antagonism only occurs where one religion or another gains an alliance with power, with economic power, political power, even military power. But it seems that we're not very good at handling power. And when one religion gains the power over another, or one variety of the same religion gains power over another, that conflict is inevitable. And this has been a very real fear in Britain, that the religions will not be able to get on with each other. I remember when immigration was at its height after World War II, and Enoch Powell, the f member of parliament, made a famous speech that he anticipated rivers of blood in the streets by the influx of so many different cultures and the confrontation between different religions. It was called the rivers of blood speech. Well, that's the first possibility. It's the possibility of hostility and even hatred between the two. And when either gets the opportunity of power or even both get the opportunity of power, then there's going to be real trouble. And of course, community peace, community harmony is one of the great desires of our age. None of us want to go back to the kind of conflicts that have cost lives. So what's the second possibility? That is the possibility of separatism, of keeping them apart from each other. That's very difficult to achieve when they're mixed in the same street or area. Nevertheless, some people say the way to keep peace between the religions is to keep them apart as far as possible. And following that through, that means a number of other things. First, it means the privatizing of religion to make sure that religions don't enter the public sphere. So that uh, the thinking is anybody can practice any religion as long as they do so in private, keep it to themselves. And there is a strong move today to keep religion out of the public sphere, out of the media, out of politics, out of commerce, out of the public domain. Keep it private and that will separate or keep the religion separate. There's something else that follows. And that is that if we're going to try and keep them separate, we must forbid proselytizing. And this is uh, practiced in some countries, for example, Malaysia. 
The Christians are free to practice their religion. They are free to advertise their meetings. But if they do so, they must always include the words, not for Muslims. And in this way, the government there hopes to keep separate the religions, allowing freedom to practice, but it must be private freedom. The ultimate end of this thinking, separatism, is to produce ghettos. It's a strange word that. It comes from Venice, where there was an ancient iron foundry, which was closed down, and the Jews of Venice were all herded into the foundry, which was called in Italian a ghetto. And that word has stuck ever since. And it means to encourage people of different religions to move in together into separate districts. This was behind the Bishop of Rochester's recent uh, pronouncement that there are now no-go areas in Britain, meaning that there are regions of one religion and others should not go into those regions or it would offend and upset the people living there. Do we want to see the cities of Britain in separate ghettos with one religion in one district, one, another in another and so on? Well, it might bring peace. I had three children, we s still have, but one's in heaven now. But the three children were constantly in trouble with each other. We could certainly keep the peace by putting them each in separate room and say, now go to your bedroom, each of you, and we got peace in the house. But it was a peace of a negative kind. What we wanted to see was peace between our three children when they were together, getting on in harmony. So we moved to the third possibility. The first is a relationship of antagonism. Second, a relationship of separatism, keeping religions as far apart as we can. The third possibility is the subject of the title of my talk, Pluralism. Now let's just examine what we really mean by pluralism. It isn't just plurality. Plurality of religion is the fact we've got different religions living in the same area. That's plurality. Pluralism is the idea that we want to see different religions living together. It's the belief that diversity is better than uniformity, that we want to encourage different religions and different cultures and become a multicultural, multi-faith society. And we now know it's been revealed in the last few months that behind the open immigration policy of our government, there was this idea that we welcome diversity and unity. It's a good thing because now we live in a global village. We're very much aware of living on a world scale. And it is the belief that local countries and even local communities should reflect the diversity of the whole world and demonstrate that we are now one world. Now that's the theory of pluralism, the belief that diversity is welcome, something we want to see. Along with that goes the idea of what we call an egalitarian society. In simple language, that means a society in which all are equal. There's been a tremendous stress on equality in the last few decades. Men and women must be equal. Black and white must be equal. Rich and poor must be equal. And relating that idea to religion, of course, it's the belief that all religions are equal, equal in value. They are all different ways to one God. That's the thinking behind pluralism. And therefore, that encourages religions to see themselves as part of a whole and different ways. And there is certainly a lot of practice in common between religions. Prayer is common to most of them. Fasting is another. And uh, most religions teach a way of life. 
an ethical or moral way of living. And so pluralism wants to see this all brought together so that uh, we respect each other and accept each other. That we look at other religions and we say, Christians are only one among many and we must learn to accept each other as true. But here we run up against the price that is paid for that thinking. And the price is that we no longer can have any absolutes. There is no such thing now as absolute truth and therefore there's no such thing as absolute falsehood. There is no such thing as absolute right when we think of behavior and therefore there's no such thing as absolute wrong. Everything, everything is relative. We call this outlook relativism and behind pluralism is this relativism that treats everything equally. In other words, what is true for you may not be true for me. And what is right for me may not be right for you. We must learn to live with each other, respect each other's points of view. No one can say we have the truth. No one can say to everybody else, this is the right way to live or that is the wrong way to live. It's all relative. No longer are things black and white, but shades of gray in between. That's the price we pay for relativism and therefore for pluralism. It's a heavy price because the ultimate outcome of that way of thinking is simply the disintegration of society. It means that society becomes like a ship without a compass. Which way do we head? Well, we'll just go the way of the majority opinion and majority opinion will change from time to time and therefore we are literally at sea. That's the ultimate end of pluralism. It does not ask the question, what is truth? It doesn't ask which religion is true. It doesn't ask which way of behavior is right. It says everybody's right, everybody's true, but you can only say this is true for me and not for anyone else. This is the behavior that is right for me. And therefore, absolute standards give way to political standards. And so political error becomes more serious than moral ever, error. Political correctness becomes the guideline, but that will change from society to society and from age to age. It is not a reliable guide. We need, all of us, some objective guidance. What is true in our beliefs and what is right in our behavior? That's the third possibility and it is widely accepted today. The fourth possibility of the relationship between the religions is what we call syncretism. And that's the belief that you could bring all the religions together, take the best of each, fit them together, and have one world religion. Now that we're living in one world, this global village together, this has become the dream of many people. Could we somehow create a religion that will bring all of them together? That's been a dream of many for a long, long time. It was the dream of an American politician called John Foster Dulles. And he used to hold what he called Congress, World Congress of Faith in San Francisco. And the aim there was to bring all the religions of the world together into one so that we can have one world religion and that will hold the world together. It's a dream. Do you know it's uh, Tony Blair's dream as well? He has laid the foundation of what he calls the Faith Foundation and he said, I will dedicate the rest of my life to uniting the religions of the world together. He's only the last in a long line of people. 
we can go right back to Muhammad. Now, when Muhammad fled from Mecca to Medina, he came into a community where there were Jews and Christians, and he approached them with what he called a common word. And he said, we all believe in one God. Why don't we get together? Why don't we have one religion that could become the religion of the whole world? The Jews and the Christians declined the invitation when he offered it so many hundreds of years ago. But that invitation has been renewed about two years ago when a whole lot of Muslim scholars have produced a second common word, as they call it. And that common word has been given to Catholic Christians and evangelical Christians hoping for a coming together of the different faiths. The Catholics are still considering that, but the evangelicals have responded positively to that appeal. Among them, well-known evangelical names like John Stott and George Verwer and Brother Andrew and many another who have signed up to respond positively to this approach. So again, there is a hope emerging, and this time coming from Islam again, that we will become one religion. Well, there have been many other attempts. One was uh, an aim to do that, and if you go to Haifa in Israel today, there's a magnificent uh, building with a golden to uh, dome up on the hillside with magnificent gardens around it. It's the center of the Baha'i faith. Now, the Baha'i faith aimed at bringing all religions together into one. All they've done, actually, is to achieve yet another religion, the Baha'i faith. But nevertheless, that was their origin and their great hope that it would happen. Now, let's look more closely at this because this is the stage we're at. This country is moving beyond pluralism. We don't want antagonism. We can't practice separatism. We were into pluralism, believing that it was a good thing to have all these religions and cultures together. But now we are moving into the fourth stage of syncretism, this idea that somehow we can match one world with one religion in it, somehow bring them together. And so we are seeing services of worship in cathedrals with all the religions in our country taking part, each reading from their own scriptures, each wearing their own robes or special dress. And so we're into this syncretism phase now. Let's say straight away that we will never be able to syncretize our beliefs. Our beliefs are so contradictory to each other that you cannot combine them. And therefore, we can never bring religions all together into one on the basis of our beliefs. Let me just illustrate that. If you ask some very simple questions, the answers will be so varied and so contradictory that the impossibility will emerge. For example, simple question, how many gods are there? And immediately you will get inconsistent answers to this very simple question. Judaism will say one. Islam will say one. And it came as a protest to the 360 gods that the Arabs of Arabia were worshipping before Muhammad uh, simplified their religion. Hindus will say up to 30 million. Buddhists will say none at all, because Buddhism doesn't believe in God. It believes in a way of life. And so we could go on. What's the answer? Christianity comes up with a totally different answer, that God is both one and three, and that he is three persons in one. And that's a unique answer, but it's totally different from every other religion. So how are we going to get 
religions together when they give such a different answer to a very simple question. There's another simple question. What kind of God is God? What's he like? Does he have feelings like we have feelings? Is he kind or cruel? Does he care about us or is he indifferent to us? There have been so many answers to that simple question. In fact, recently a Gallup poll in this country said, asked, do you believe in God? And 66% said yes. But that's an irrelevant statistic. We need to know which God you believe in and what kind of God you believe in. I believe that last question is the most important of all because on that answer will depend our whole relationship to God. What kind of God are we trying to relate to? What is he really like? So at the level of belief, there's no chance whatever of getting the religions of the world together into one as syncretism desires. So the question then arose, then what other basis can we bring them together on? What foundation could we lay? And here we're getting a most surprising answer today, not on beliefs. Those are so contradictory that I would summarize that by saying all the religions of the world could be wrong, but only one can be right. When the beliefs are so dissimilar, all of them could be wrong, but only one of them could be right. So we must find another basis, goes the thinking of syncretism. And that basis being found in behavior. We could unite the religions of the world and get them into one religion if we focus not on their different beliefs, but on their similar behavior. And that is now the great pressure on us to come together into one religion on the basis of what are called values. I'm sure you've heard that word recently. It's becoming very, very common. Let's bring the religions of the world together on the basis of their values. Take one example. I switched on the radio last Sunday morning and the first item I heard was a nun pleading with the different religions of the world to get together. In fact, it's this week is a multi-faith week. And she was saying, we all agree on compassion, pity for those who are less fortunate and the willingness to do something about that. That's how she defined compassion. And she said, all religions preach and practice compassion. Here is the uniting point that could bring us all together into one. That's the argument. Forget the different beliefs. Let's get on with the united behavior. The second thing I listened to on the radio last Sunday morning was the morning worship, which came from Windsor Castle. And there the Duke of Edinburgh and the General Secretary of the United Nations were sharing in a service of worship whose objective was to bring all the religions of the world together to save the environment. I'd already heard years ago the Duke of Edinburgh preach, the only time I ever knew he preached, and it was in the same location, St. George's Chapel of Windsor. And his theme that time was, let the religions of the world unite to save wildlife. And so there is now a great pressure on all the religions of the world, and it's coming from the world itself, unite to help us, unite to save mankind, unite to save planet Earth. Instead of fighting over your beliefs, unite to deal with the fundamental and urgent issues of our day. That's the new form that syncretism is taking. But it's making a radical shift certainly for Christianity and indeed, I believe, for other religions. First, it's shifting our attention from God to man. The whole emphasis on, is on what we do for God, not what God does for us. 
let's unite and get on with the job. But the focus becomes man and his needs and not God and his needs. Well, of course, he hasn't any, but he's wanting something from us and he's wanting to do something for us. But that emphasis tends to disappear. The second thing that happens to religion, if it's united on practical questions, is that the focus shifts from the next world to this world. And we are now uh, letting the world set the agenda for Christian activity. And so many preachers are preaching on global climate change, as if that's the biggest issue for churches to face today. So there's been a shift away from God and to man. There's been a shift away from the next world and religions like Christianity that teach that this life is only a prelude to a much longer life after death and that this life is to prepare for that. But the focus now is on how to be better in this world, how to make this world better for everybody. And a third shift is from immorality to injustice. That it's far more important for Christians to rise up and deal with injustice than for them to fight immorality. And so these three big shifts are occurring because of this intense pressure to unite for practical purposes in this world. I have said elsewhere that right-wing Christians tend to be more concerned about immorality. Left-wing Christians are more concerned about injustice, but God, being righteous, is concerned about both. He's concerned with our personal morality. He's also concerned with social justice. He's both. And therefore, neither right-wing Christians nor left-wing Christians can claim him as total supporters of their position. In fact, he's both, so we must be both. But it's so much easier to get fired up to deal with injustice for others than to get enthusiastic about morality for yourself. One is individual, the other is corporate. Well, now that's syncretism. It's against that backcloth that I want to begin to speak about the uniqueness of Christ. The simple fact is that Jesus Christ cannot be fitted in to any of those four possibilities. He is so different, so unique, that he cannot be fitted in. And that makes Christianity an exclusive religion and an inclusive religion. That sounds a contradiction, doesn't it? It's exclusive because Christ is so unique that he cannot be linked with any other religious founder, with any other focus of any faith. He stands alone and by himself. Uniqueness means only one of a kind, and he is one of a kind and the only one. And I'm going to go through some of the things that make him quite unique. But it means that his religion is not only exclusive, but inclusive. It is a religion for everybody, for the whole world. Now, of course, we have before us two religions which have a global ambition. Islam believes that one day the whole world will become Muslim and Allah will be the only God there is. They have a global ambition. So has Christianity, but a rather different one. They believe that Christ told us to go and preach to every creature, to make disciples of every ethnic group. And therefore, Christians have a duty, an obligation, a mandate to gain, to go and preach in the whole world. They believe that Jesus died for Muslims, for Buddhists, for Confucius, for Shintoists, 
they believe that Christ is relevant to everybody. Now here you've got two religions, both of which are global in their thinking. That's going to prevent syncretism. It's going to prevent separatism. It's going to prevent a lot of things. But that's all based on the one fact that there is nobody else like Jesus. There never has been and there never will be. So let's begin to run through some of those things which are different in Jesus from everybody else that separate him from Muhammad and Buddha and Confucius, that put him in a category all by himself. The first thing is the way he came into the world. And that was extraordinary. He was the only person, well, not quite, but he was a person who came into this world without there having been an act of sexual intercourse. Mary, his mother, was a virgin when he was born. She had never known men. That cannot be said of anyone else except that a professor of gynecology in London University told me that there have been some other virgin births. That the human egg, the ovum in a woman's body, has been known to begin to divide spontaneously without being fertilized. It's a, a scientific process known in nature called parthenogenesis, where sexual fertilization is not necessary for a life to be produced. So there have been, this professor told me, maybe half a dozen other cases of babies born to a virgin. But in every single case that he knew about, he said the result was a girl. And that's because every egg in a woman's body is female. It is only when a male sperm gets into the picture that the possibility of a boy comes. And so there may have been other virgin births through this spontaneous division of an egg in a woman's body, but it was always a girl. Mary, however, produced a boy, and that in itself betokens a miraculous intervention on the part of God. Mary could not possibly have produced a boy by herself. But there's more than that to it. Mary's birth was normal. Jesus' birth was normal. Some hours of labor and the boy was, baby was produced. What was abnormal happened nine months earlier at the conception. That's when the real miracle happened. So Jesus' birth was normal, except as one gynecologist pointed out, Mary's hymen was pierced by a male from the inside rather than the outside. That's the only difference in his birth. But in his conception, nine months earlier, there was a supernatural event which has never happened before or since. It makes Jesus unique. Now, intriguingly, Muslims accept the virgin birth of Jesus, quite different from what they believe about Muhammad's birth, which was quite normal. Muslims actually accept the virgin birth of Jesus from Mary, but they don't accept one thing about his birth that is absolutely different from every other human being, and it's this. He chose to be born. Nobody else chose to be born. You didn't choose to be born. I didn't choose to be born. I didn't choose my parents. I couldn't. I didn't choose the social level at which I would uh, live. But he did. He chose to be born. Now that no other religion will accept, but Christians believe it. Later in life, he never said, I was born. He always said, I came. I decided to come. He then sent, said again and again, I was sent by God my Father. 
Now these two words, came and sent, are the basis on which I say that Jesus was the only human being who ever chose to be born and live in this world. It was a deliberate decision. And on numerous occasions, he told us why he had made that decision. What was his purpose behind the choice to become a human being like us? We then move to his boyhood. And once again, we have a unique glimpse. Considering that Jesus is probably the best known person who ever lived, we know hardly anything about the first 30 years of his life. It's an astonishing veil has dropped over his earlier life. Right until the age of 30, we know nothing except for one little glimpse into his life as a boy. Every Jewish boy at the age of 12 undergoes a social transition from being a boy to becoming a man. They call it the bar mitzvah. It's a proud moment in a boy's life when he's treated from then on as a man, as an adult. And usually the principle is that he leaves his toys behind at 12 and he becomes a partner in his father's business. That's what happened to Jesus. In those days, the way they traveled needs to be mentioned. The women always traveled first walking 15 miles a day, and then they would set up the camp, cook an evening meal, and the men would come along at leisure, have the meal, and go to bed in the tents. Well, uh, feminists may not like that, but that's the way they did it. And they went up to, to Jerusalem for the feast when Jesus was 12, and as a boy, he would travel by day, 15 miles a day walking with his mother. But when you come back from your bar mitzvah, you walk with your father. You are now a man and you're treated like a man. Well, they went up to Jerusalem when he was 12 and he went there with his mother. But when they came away from Jerusalem, and his father and mother walked 15 miles, set up camp. I can imagine what happened. Mary said, where's Jesus? And Joseph said, well, I thought he would travel with you. You're his mother. I'm not his father. I thought he'd travel with you. And uh, they realized they'd lost him. They went back to Jerusalem. They found him in the temple, discussing with priests the most deep questions about God. And Mary said to him, your father and I have been looking everywhere for you. And he replied, but I've joined my father's business. And at the age of 12, he clearly saw himself as totally different from other babies. He knew that God was his father in a very literal sense, that he wouldn't have been born without God. And he knew that Joseph was only his foster father. So that little glimpse as a boy of 12 makes him totally different from anyone else. He knew that without God, he could not possibly have been born. Now we've just looked at his birth and we've looked at his boyhood and we've caught these glimpses of someone who is quite different and quite unique. But now we're going to move on. At the age of 30, he really strode onto the public stage and he became a public figure and his public ministry began. And from then on, people noticed strikingly different features in his public life. There were, first of all, his miracles, the things he did. Then there was his morality, the, what he was. And then we're going to look at what he said, his words, his message. And these three things single him out. Now, before we look in detail, let's say straight away, we are dependent on records made by people who knew him. 
and we have the choice. You can accept the record or you can reject it. What you can't do is select from it what you want. It's not a pick and mix situation. You either accept the record of those who knew him and those who wrote within living memory of him, or you reject. You cannot say, I like this and I don't like that, or I believe this, but I don't believe that. The record stands. And this is what the record says about his public life. Firstly, he did miracles. There are even records outside the Bible that tell us he did miracles. So we know that that was his reputation. When we look at the things he did, some of them are familiar and done by other people, particularly the things he did for people. He would heal diseases, he would cast out demons. Well, other people were doing that then, and other people still do it now. That doesn't make him terribly different, though he certainly had success in that area, dealing with extreme conditions like leprosy. But he also raised dead people within hours of them having died. But in one case, we have someone who's been dead four days and putrefaction has already set in. He's stinking and Jesus brings him back to life, which is perhaps the most extraordinary miracle that he performed on people. But the record also states that he did miracles on things with the material world, that he changed water into wine, for example, that he fed thousands of people from one boy's picnic lunch. Above all, that he controlled the weather by word only, without any apparatus, without any help. He commanded the weather to change and saved his disciples from drowning. On another occasion, he came to a fig tree, hungry, hoping there'd be some figs on the tree. There weren't. And he cursed the tree. And next morning, not a leaf on the tree. The tree has died. The wood has just lost its sap. And all of these things he did with a word only. Now we must either accept the record or reject it. We can't say, well, this was a psychosomatic activity. We must either accept or reject the record. But I'm telling you what the record is. When we turn from what he did to what he was, we're looking at something very different. It is astonishing that nobody, but nobody, has ever been able to criticize Jesus for doing wrong. That's an astonishing thing. It was the testimony of himself. He said to his worst enemies, which of you can find a sin in me? Now, I wouldn't dare say that to my best friends. To say it to your worst enemies is unique. And they were silent. They could not find it. We live in a day when it's become the custom to dig out dirt of people who've lived before, find some secret in their life, some conspiracy, some, something bad. And there are so many programs on TV or articles in the tabloid press telling us this person was not so good as everybody thought they were. And we've managed to dig up some hidden information, some sleaze. Nobody has ever been able to do that with Jesus. They've been able to do it with other founders of religion, but not with him. He literally was perfect. And that has been acknowledged by, not just by Christians, but by many other people who just could not fault the way he behaved. So we have two remarkable things about Jesus. We have first, the miracles he did. Second, the morality he lived, what he was. And that was so unique that even people who lived alongside him 
slept in the same room, ate at the same table, just felt dirty. One of his closest friends says, get away from me, I'm a sinful man, you shouldn't be mixing with the likes of me. That was their reaction. When you meet someone who's totally pure, totally moral, it makes you feel ashamed of yourself. And that's the reaction that Jesus produced, even in those who knew him so intimately, who lived with him for three years, that was still their reaction. So that raises a huge question about Jesus. And the question is this, how come a man who only did such good things for other people and who lived such a good life was after only three years executed as a dangerous criminal. Everybody knows those facts. Everybody knows that within just three years he was hanging on a cross and he was there because he was regarded as too dangerous to be allowed to live any longer. How come? Mind you, Socrates, one of the Greek philosophers, had said years before, if ever a perfect man enters the world, he'll be killed. He realized that a really good person would be such a challenge to the consciences of everybody else that they would hate him for it. And sure enough, that happened. But we still have to explain why did the authorities of his own people regard him as such a dangerous criminal? As uh, one of his friends, Peter, was later to say, he went about doing good. And he was good. He did good and he was good. So why on earth did they put him to death so quickly? Well, the answer lies in what he said, not in what he did, not in what he was, but in what he said. And it's when we look at his teaching that we realize why he could not be allowed to live. Well, you can divide his teaching up into two parts. There was his teaching for others, teaching others how they should live, and there was the teaching about himself. And it was the last part that really caused his death. His teaching for other people has been acknowledged widely as the highest moral teaching there has ever been. Even non-Christians admit this. And people have said the Sermon on the Mount is the finest morality you will ever find. And if only the world lived out the Sermon on the Mount, it, this world would be the most wonderful place for everybody. The only problem is it's a very difficult standard to reach, very difficult for human nature to react Jesus' way. For example, he didn't allow any revenge or any retaliation, any resentment towards people who abused you or offended you. Now, it's very hard for human nature to reach such a height. He said, you mustn't only not murder people, you mustn't even think they're a fool. You mustn't even hate them in your heart because that's murder already. He said, you mustn't commit adultery, but he said, you can do that in your heart. You can do it by looking at a woman and lusting after her. And he said, you can even do it legally by divorcing and remarrying. Now, these standards were so high that people have acknowledged this is the finest morality the world has yet heard of, but it's impracticable, it's impossible. Two people who greatly admired Jesus' moral teaching were Mahatma Gandhi in India and Dostoevsky in Russia. And they said, this is how we ought to live. If everybody lived this way, we would have no problems in human relationships. And of course, Gandhi practiced the nonviolence of the Sermon on the Mount and achieved a great deal by so doing. 
but Gandhi was not perfect. He didn't live up to his own teaching, nor did anybody else. I think Jesus is the only one who has ever lived up to the highest moral teaching he gave others. But it's what he said about himself that created the biggest problem. He made claims for himself that nobody else has ever made or could possibly make. And we're going to look at some of those claims in depth because this is what makes Jesus absolutely unique. This is why we can't combine him with other religions. For Christianity is Christ. It's been said many times, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. And how can we have a relationship with somebody who died 2,000 years ago? You can't. As soon as someone dies, the relationship ends. Our eldest daughter died a few years ago. That ended our relationship. We often think about it, but we can't talk to her. She can't talk to us. The relationship has gone. Though as a Christian, I am absolutely sure that relationship will start again. But at the moment, it cannot be the same. We can't touch her. She can't touch us. We can't hear her. She can't hear us. And death ends a relationship. Now, the fact is that every other founding father of a faith is dead. They're gone. I can't have a living relationship with Muhammad, with Confucius, with Buddha. They're all gone. And therefore, I just cannot have a living relationship. I may try to practice what they taught, but that's another matter. But I can no longer have a relationship with those who are dead and gone. With Jesus, we can. And that's what I want to expand on in my next talk to you. When I talk about the uniqueness of Christ, I've already begun to do that. But I'm going to come right to the heart of it the next time we're able to get together. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to talk about these things. I hope you've found them relevant, interesting, and I hope you see what's happening in our world, in the religious sphere, and this, above all, this pressure to unite on what we call values, to unite in behavior, even if we can't unite in beliefs. Beliefs, impossible. We'll never get the religions together on that basis. But there is the possibility of getting them together to fight human injustice, to fight social evil, to fight the trade in human beings, to fight for the environment, to save wildlife, all those other things. Can we get together to do that? Well, we could, but it becomes humanism. It becomes a humanitarian activity. It ceases to be a divine religion. Well, come back for the second talk and we'll explore those things further. Thank you for listening.